All right, hey everybody. Good evening to all of you out there. I am excited to be here. I am full of enchiladas and I am pretty pumped because we're talking about types of games tonight. And this is one of my favorite topics. I love to geek out about the types of games. This is actually like a really hot topic in the nerdy board game world. Like it's not really a big deal to like casual gamers or non-gamers, but I think it's really important if you're kind of getting used to game design, if you're teaching it to someone or you yourself are learning it, it's good to know about the different types of games out there. I don't think it matters if you can't classify a game, but one great way to start designing games is like, think of two genres and mash them up. Uh, I was just listening to a game design podcast and that's one of the things that uh, the person recommended is just think about two games you really like and think of a mashup for inspiration for a uh, game that you're just trying to design or, or use as inspiration if you're trying to take a topic you're learning about or a topic you want to explore. Try to mash up some of these styles. And so tonight, I think it's going to be really fun because there's going to be game suggestions. Um, there's going to be strategies for doing these types of games. There's going to be subcategories um, and there's going to be a lot. And of course, like every episode, I'm going to start out with where we're at in Game Stormers, the upcoming commercial game for those casual, serious and everybody in between gamers out there that we're developing that will come out in 2022. So check that out. In the chat too, feel free to jump in with your own game suggestions for genres if you completely disagree with me about a type of genre. If you have any questions, anything like that, if you wanna make fun of me, uh, I'm sure uh, you know Mike Washburn will point out I'm wearing the same shirt I wore on episode one and he owns this shirt, but I just like this shirt. It's good for these nice hot summer days. So I'm gonna keep wearing this shirt. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive in here. Um, I do wanna mention if you're interested in kind of what you heard today, gamestormedu.com, which I'm kind of partially covering up if you're watching the live stream, uh, is the website where you can learn more about uh, these types of games. I've got a short video. If you don't, don't wanna watch 60 minutes of the types of games, I got a video that's about six minutes on all the different types of games. I've got examples of the different types of games on the website, so you can check that out too. But I truly think if you know the game types, uh, you'll start to kind of think more creatively about game design too. I know I did once I learned about all the game types. But I mentioned a little teaser, Game Stormers, what's new with the game I'm working on designing currently. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a game where you make a game during the game. Yes, it's very Gameception-y, uh, but uh, I'm super excited about it. I think it's gonna be fun for a variety of different people and types of game players too, uh, which will be a whole nother episode, like the types of game players and making games for different game players. But again, I digress. So first of all, I'm pointing over here, uh, if you are seeing the screen right now, you're not listening to this as a podcast, uh, that is the robot assistant drawing that Vika Fajardo, my wonderful artist, uh, finalized this past week, and I think he looks awesome. He is an item in the game, so you could add him to your game as a playable character, or maybe an enemy, or something like that, or, or anything, or maybe he's a card in your game. Uh, as well, so you can kind of uh, make make the robot assistant part of your game, or you could use his ability, which I've forgotten what it is now. I think it's in a later slide, but uh, that is uh, kind of one cool thing that's uh, just been finalized for the game is one of our item cards, and he'll probably grace the cover of the game as well because he looks so cool. And then the other thing too that's kind of neat is uh, Sloan the Summoner, which is a character. She'll be on the game art cover. Um, also the artist, uh, kind of, she, she finished up kind of the rough sketch of that one. And so that was what Sloan the Summoner looks like. The bonus with that illustration is that Sloan the Summoner is named for my daughter who, um, is a little over two months old. And so it's kind of cool. I'm working my daughter into the game. She doesn't quite look like that. She looks much shorter, less hair, not as coordinated as that woman in the illustration. So, uh, the artist is hopefully going to be finishing up the final drawing for that in the near future and uh, the hopefully the cover art is gonna start coming together here pretty quick. So pretty excited. Uh, the art is looking just fantastic. And that's, I think the key, if you're gonna release a commercial game, you have to have just beautiful art to really draw people in. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm drawn to like a great cover. And so I'm excited for this final art because uh, Sloan the Summoner is gonna be kind of the focal point of the cover art, which is exciting. So that's what's new. Uh, I also want to put out there too, um, I had Brad a few weeks ago ask about playtesting. If you're interested in playtesting, reach out to me. Uh, I am looking for playtesters to give me feedback on the game and continue to refine it. 
And so if you want to do that, john at gamestoremedia.com, you can reach out to me or DM me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be, um, you know, send me a fax, whatever you prefer uh, if you want to play test. So just want to get that out there. And now on with the show, talking about types of games tonight, going to be game recommendations, going to be tips for designing these games, going to be ways that game stormers use these types of games in its design. Lots of fun stuff. So types of games. I mentioned before, this is one thing I realized was kind of a silver bullet when working with students, with working with teachers, and working with anybody who wanted to get into game design, is we get in this mindset of we only want to, we, we used to growing up with one type of game, and we'll talk about those types of games. They were called roll and moves. Um, I kind of opened up that terminology to roll and do's, but a lot of games when I had teachers in, in high school or middle school or elementary school, they're like, oh yeah, for extra credit, you can make a game or for your project, you make a game. What did you do? You made like a board, you rolled some dice, you land on a space, maybe you had to take a card and answer a question or something like that, right? They all look the same. And so that was one, I think, hurdle is we were, you grow up on these very specific types of games that are thematic roll and do games. And there's so many different game types out there. And, and maybe a roll and do is good for your the, the game you're trying to design, but it's very limiting. And so just exposing people to different types of games is really good. And honestly, the, the first thing I recommend doing when you're working in game design is play a bunch of games and play a bunch of different types of games. Because a lot of times I find people have never played a deck building game before and they go, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I never even thought about this as a concept. Or they play a unique party game where it's not just like a Pictionary style game or a trivia style game. They go, oh my gosh, this is so fun and creative and I get to fill in the blanks and make a funny. Uh, I've never thought of doing that in a game before. And so just even different takes on these types of games really opens people's eyes. I mentioned roll and moves, but we'll talk about roll and rights today, which are kind of a roll and do variant. So tons of games out there, going to be great. Hey, we got Sharif in the chat too. Sharif, my co-teacher in video games and learning. Excited to have Sharif on board. And uh, a lot of these games remind me of the, the greatness that is D&D, Dungeons & Dragons, which Sharif, of course, is on the wonderful show Rivals of Waterdeep, a D&D live stream show. And uh, I think a lot of what D&D does well is reflected in a lot of the different game types. So what's cool about D&D is it is a really great melding of a lot of different game types in action. So I'll try to give nods to that too. Um, so again, I mentioned exposure to different types of games makes for better design overall. So first type of game that's out there, I, this, usually these games are called worker placement, but I usually call them meeple placement games with uh, student staff, whoever I'm working with. And the reason being is because when you hear worker placement, it starts to like pigeonhole you into a certain theme of a game. So people think worker placement and suddenly it's a farming game or it's a, it's a industrial game or things like that. So I just call it meeple placement. And sometimes, you know, if I'm working with young kids or people who haven't played games, like, what's a meeple? I'm like, oh, it's the little guy you move around. Let's see. Oh, look, look at that. I got some meeples right here. And I've got some shadows going on here, too. So there's a meeple in action right there. Whoa. Meeples turning colors. So, yeah, meeple. I've called them meeple placement games because I think that's more accurate. And it opens it up to a lot of different types of games, right? And usually if you have a meeple placement game, it usually melds with others. Like Monopoly technically is a meeple placement game, right? You move your meeple, but it's also a roll and do game, right? You roll and it tells you where to put your meeple. Uh, so more often than not, meeple placement are maybe more strategic games where you're deciding where to put your meeple. And maybe if you put one meeple here, it can do something, et cetera, et cetera. So example of meeple placement game. Um, you know, on Monopoly, you're kind of on rails, right? You're going around in a circle, you know? So you, you don't really have to strategically think about placing a meeple. But Clue, you can actually decide where in the board you're going to go in Clue, right? You roll, but maybe you're going to head towards the billiards room, right? Um, and maybe you're going to head to the secret passage, you know, in the conservatory, move somewhere else to check out an area and check something off your little checklist. If you recall, if you saw the last episode, I have some feelings about Clue, not good feelings. I think it does a lot of things not well in terms of mechanics, but... Clue is a classic meeple placement game, right? You move meeples to locations. So that's one style of meeple placement. A, a meeple placement I prefer would be kind of something like Stone Age. And the first iteration of actually our Game Stormers board game was a lot like Stone Age. So you actually placed meeples strategically in different locations. Only a certain amount of meeples could fit there. So let's say I wanted to go to the quarry and get some stones. 
you know, maybe everybody was there already and I couldn't get in to get any more stone, right? It had a kind of a set limit. So I had to go and put my workers certain places. Maybe some were going to go over here and build while one was going to go gather this resource. So I've got these finite numbers of characters who can do so many actions and I had to really manage where I was putting them. That'd be an example of a worker placement game or a meeple placement game, right? Uh, so that's one example of it. Um, a really simple one that I like uh, that's really great for younger kids is King Domino. You choose which piece that you want your meeple to claim in that game. And it kind of goes in order of who had the most valuable piece the last time. So if I got a really great tile to place, now I get to pick last this time. May I get stuck with a really crummy tile for my meeple to claim. And I have to place it in my little kingdom, so to speak. So a lot of different ways to kind of do the meeple placement games or meeple movement games. And, uh, you know, a lot of different strategies to take on. So there's like the simple like go here, go there, right? Get to different locations like in Clue or more strategic like I can only move so many meeples, so many places. Where am I going to move them? Kind of a worker placement style game like Stone Age. In Game Stormers, the game used to be all meeple movement and kind of strategic use of the meeples. Very much inspired by games like Stone Age. I actually took that mechanic out because... I felt like it took too long and it was making the game drag out. So I actually cut that out of the game. And now the only example really of kind of this meeple movement is you can choose to enter the arena uh, in order to try to win more uh, credit in the game or currency in the game to spend on building your game. So um, that's something you can choose to move kind of your meeple into the arena. If somebody else joins you in the arena, you kind of do a, a pitch off. Uh, in order to win more coins or tie, or if you lose, you only get one coin. You know, not the worst, but not the best. So that's an opportunity to make coin, and that would be an example of meeple placement in the game. So not a huge example, but an example nonetheless. And one of my goals for the game was to expose people to different types of games in it. Number two, very popular game, especially if you, uh, you know, played as a, as a young kiddo, a lot of... Uh, a lot of young player games are card games, right? So you've got like Uno is a classic example of a deck game um, where you are attempting to get rid of all your cards. So something might be a function of you're trying to take the most tricks or you're trying to get rid of your cards. Or you're trying to use your cards to achieve a goal maybe or use your cards strategically to eliminate other players. A lot of different things you could be trying to do in a deck game, right? Deck games are very popular. Um, it's also very popular style for makers of board games because they're very cheap to produce. It's very easy to produce a deck of cards and then kind of price it up, you know, five times. Whereas if you have a lot of physical components that are hard to make, you know, a lot of boards, a lot of surfaces, a lot of unique items, um, a lot of like mini figurines, that makes it really hard, right? So that is something to consider, uh, you know, when designing too that people think about. Uh, one of my favorite card games, really simple to learn but hard to master would be Sushi Go. Um, so this is what's called a pick and pass deck game. Uh, and this is in a, a, lo a lot of same similar veins. One of my favorite games is Seven Wonders or in other episodes I've talked about Seven Wonders Duel being one of the best um, just games, in my opinion, for sure one of the best two player games out there. But a pick and pass game is where you actually go and you there's a, everybody starts with kind of a deck or a hand of cards out of the deck. And you take one card out of the deck maybe to place in front of you or to use down the road or to make like a trick or something like that. And then you hand it off to somebody else. So you see what they're getting. And then you get a hand from the person maybe to your right. You look at those cards, pick another one, keep passing, right? So we're kind of drawing down and maybe we're all going for different things. Maybe some of us are going for the same things. In Sushi Go, you're trying to collect the most points by pairing up kind of some of the different roles together that have abilities. And maybe you're going for the three of a kind roll, but you don't quite get there because you realize somebody else is going for it. And there's just not enough cards for the both of you. Or maybe you're going for one that powers up another, but you don't get any of the second one that powers with the first and you've wasted that draw, right? Um, or maybe you're going for just one that keeps exponentially growing as you get more of them. It's actually a lot of math happening in this game very fast. And you're playing probabilities because you don't know how many of each there are. Um, it's a big deck, and maybe there were a lot in one playthrough, but not a lot of that card in the next. A lot going on. Pick and pass card games have really come on strong in the last couple of decades. Uh, so again, an example of this would be Sushi Go. Another version of this is Seven Wonders. We were trying to build a great society by picking and passing out of uh, a deck. Uh, another interesting one um, 
you know, there's a lot of trick-taking games out of a traditional 52-card deck. Uh, trick-taking games out there from my local area would be Euchre, of course, is a very popular trick-taking game or hearts or things of that nature. Um, this is an interesting one called The Fox in the Forest where you're taking tricks and different animals in the forest have different abilities in the trick-taking game. This is a two-player game. And I, I talk about, I feel like, two-player games a lot just because... Um, you know, I only have a young daughter, uh, so it's me and my wife during the pandemic had to kind of stock up on two-player games. So this would be an example of a good two-player card game. But an interesting take on the trick-taking where you've got not only just you need to have the best card, but maybe certain cards give you abilities out of your hand too. So that's a very popular type of deck game is a trick-taking deck game. I need to take the most uh, plays to win the day, right? And then um, probably one of my favorite genres is the deck building game. This is one genre where I feel like people, uh, you know, this isn't common to the casual, uh, maybe board or card gamer, but deck building games are where you actually start maybe with a set deck from the game, and then you have the ability to add more cards to your deck. And as you play cards, you recycle through your deck. When you get new cards, they go into kind of that reshuffle and maybe you've upgraded your deck on the next playthrough. Maybe your goal is to eliminate an opponent. Um, you know, that might be one example of a goal you have. Or maybe another one's to get through um, kind of a, a dungeon crawler using your deck. Or in the case of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, which I've got over here, this is a game that I, I bought for my wife because she's a big um, Harry Potter fan. And actually, I really enjoyed this game. It's a cooperative deck building. So you're kind of working together. You have an individual deck. You might be one of the core characters, like, you know, I think maybe I was Hermione Granger and my wife was Harry or, you know, I keep wanting to say uh, Rupert Grint, but uh, um, it's, uh, it, what's his name? Uh, Harry's buddy. This is embarrassing. I'm totally blanking. Ron. Ron Weasley. <laughs> I couldn't think of Ron Weasley's name. So uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts battle is pretty cool. It also works through the books. Like the, the characters you battle are like the, you know, in the first few books are the characters you run into, like the troll or something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe you run into, um, you know, some of the other minor characters. And then as you start getting into later books, you start running into, you know, the first iteration of Voldemort, things like that. Uh, so you start seeing some of those Death Eaters coming in, uh, you know, that you're fighting as well. And just the nice part I like about it is you can plan with your teammates. So you can say, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to pull this card in my deck to use in future rounds. That one will complement your skill set really nicely. So you're kind of building up this, this deck. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good one. Uh, I see some people saying, uh, Sharif and Vika saying they need to check it out. Uh, it, it is one, I, I felt like it was too, too easy, uh, to start, but then it ramped up a little bit. And I've heard some people say they thought it was too hard. So maybe my wife and I were just either lucky or good or totally misunderstood the rules and were cheating. Also a possibility, but it was very fun. It was cleverly done. Um, I kept trying to, um, get enough like currency to purchase the Albus Dumbledore because I felt like, how do you lose with Dumbledore in your deck? Uh, but that was not a good strategy. So i just uh, just going to point that out. <laughs> uh, so taking a look at Game Stormers uh, and thinking about how the deck works into it, this game is like very much a deck game. It starts with a core kind of deck of cards. You've got, in the, in the game, you've got 50 item cards to start with 50 mechanic cards and 25 storyline cards. So you've got this deep deck where you're trying to actually build kind of a tableau in front of you of a game. So that's kind of where the, the deck game comes into play. And there's other games like that where you're kind of laying out a tableau in front of you to score points. Um, as I mentioned before, Seven Wonders is you're kind of playing cards in front of you. Maybe some of them aren't worth anything at the time, but they become more worth, uh, you know, point valued. Uh, so our game uses victory points, much like Seven Wonders uses victory points. King of Tokyo uses victory points. A lot of games use victory points out there. So um, that is how kind of Game Stormers does it. You can see an example card over here, and the artist of that card, Vika, is in the chat, which is neat. She made that haunted ship that you see. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, that you can see too the cards have abilities, which some games just have a pure card that's just, here's what it, here's its symbol, here's what it does, you know, maybe you combine it with others. This one is a card that has victory points and has an ability and has a categorization. So a lot of different games handle their cards differently. So this is an example of get to a certain point with your cards, right? So uh, another way to approach it. Another type of game, and again, you might be noticing this right now, a lot of games cross into multiple genres. I mentioned that Dungeons & Dragons is going to cross into a bunch. Dungeons & Dragons is a cooperative game. 
Um, it is going to be a roll and do game. It is going to be a creative slash party game, right? Um, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned, uh, you know, a few other titles in here, like Seven Wonders. That's going to be a game um, where you're doing definitely like a deck game style, but there's other elements involved with it as well, too. Cooperation games are going to meld with a ton of different ones, but at its core, a game might be a cooperation game, but then also as a subset of another type. So a lot of different cooperation games out there. Um, one of my favorites is Five Minute Dungeon. Uh, this is a, a Kickstarter game um, that I just thought was very well designed for a number of different reasons. Number one, uh, having a game only last five minutes is pretty genius. If you have some non-gamers in your group, they don't have to invest a lot of time into something they don't enjoy. So the fast pace is really nice. Um, and it's about communication and speed. So not only do you need to be fast, but you need to be strategic in how you communicate. Your goal is to play your cards in a way to defeat um, the dungeon cards that come up in front of you. So you have to play the right cards to defeat them uh, as you're playing. So this is a cooperative card game, right? Cooperative deck game uh, where you're using your cards to eliminate enemies. Kind of similar to Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, one game that I, that this has been a huge hit, especially during the pandemic, as we played it virtually, uh, Just One, which I believe was a Spiel des Jahres winner or finalist. I think it won maybe a year or two ago. Uh, Just One is a very simple game. This is going to be in our creative slash party games that we'll talk about in a little bit as a category. But also, um, this is a cooperative game. And that's what I really like about it is you don't always run into party games that are fully cooperative, meaning everybody's working together. A lot of creative party games are team versus team, individual versus each individual. Um, if you're playing like kind of a secret role game, it's like a lot versus a few, right? So this is a game I love because everybody is on the same team. We're all working towards the same goal. You could do this as two teams versus two teams, but I've always played it as everybody together. It's fun. You know, it's very supportive. It's, it's a great game. So the, the premise of this game, if you haven't played it, highly recommend buying this. Um, one person who is kind of the guesser, you know, pulls up a card. They pick a number. Everybody looks at the card, and maybe their word is chocolate. And so the goal of everybody who's giving clues is to get them to guess chocolate, like a lot of different games out there. And so everybody gets to write a word on their dry erase board. They do this in secret. They write on it. So you can see on the screen, if you're looking at the screen, if you're listening to just the audio, um, there are words like milk, white, Belgian, sweet, dark hazelnuts. And so before they show the player all of their hints, they compare hints. And let's say two people had milk. They gave milk chocolate as a hint. The player who's guessing doesn't see either of those. So you can't have any repeats. So you need to think of a creative just one word to give them, right? So we'd lose milk, and then they'd only see white, Belgian, sweet, dark, and let's say hazelnuts was on there. So they get four instead of the six clues, or if you're playing with four people, two people match, they get one clue, makes it kind of tough. So you have to be really careful uh, that you don't pick a too common of an idea, or maybe if you're brave, you can guess the common one, or give the common one, hoping that nobody else wanted to because they were scared. So really creative, kind of mind-bending, clue-giving game, really fun, really simple, works from a distance too, which is great. Uh, and so this is an example of a cooperative game that has a simple premise, but is very deep in terms of strategy. And it has that tension of, oh gosh, will somebody pick this word, won't they? So you have this nerves of showing your clues to your teammates and then also showing your clue to the guesser as well. So it's just two layers of nerves. And anytime you can add those moments of nerves, it's really great, unless you don't like being nervous. <laughs> and so, in GameStormers, there's not a ton of cooperative elements. There's two that I've kind of highlighted. Uh, I've put in um, kind of as a house rule, um, something that people can or, or can choose to do or not choose to do is they can choose to be able to trade cards out of hand. So if people want to trade cards for credit, you know, currency in the game, or they want to just do a straight up trade, they can do that. In thinking back to the last episode, which is a little bit about mechanics, one of the things I had as a goal for this game is that nobody's encumbered from making their game, right? They, they have to get enough money to, you know, of course, buy the materials to make their games, you know, the cards that they want in them, or they have to make them themselves, but there shouldn't be anything staying your way. So if somebody got the card that you think is a perfect fit and you and that person talk and they're like, hey, I'll give it away for a price, I'll trade you straight up so I can get something that I need or a power I can use, great. Uh, one ability I took away was like, players being able to just steal a card from you. That didn't seem in the spirit of the game. I could ruin somebody's eventual game, and that's not fun for them, right? Totally blows up 
the premise of the game. So trades, I think, is fine. If both people agree that it's good for them, great. Voting, too. This game is about voting, and you're actually incentivized to vote like for who you think is going to win. That's one big problem I see in voting games is if that is the mechanism to determine who wins, why wouldn't I throw... If I'm very competitive and not like just a good person, and I will say, and, and I, I could say this, I was a student once, and we were voting for like who we thought had the best presentation, but if you think you did and you don't want to lose once you vote for somebody you know isn't going to win, right? So in Game Stormers, you actually get two more victory points if you vote for the eventual winner. So that's a mechanic that incentivizes people to vote for the winner, right? It's kind of like in Balderdash, if you ever played that, you want to vote for, you know, you're incentivized to vote for the one you think is the most legit answer. And so it's incentivizing you to try and not just throw away your vote on something you don't think is going to win, right? So that would be an example of, what you know, a benefit. Or other games where vote for the most creative if you're on that winning team you get plus one to your score, right? So there is motivation. Now, if somebody doesn't care about points, not much you can do. They might throw away their vote. But that's uh, an example of it being cooperative. I want, I'm, I'm looking out for others. Not only am I, am I saying I want you to win, but also it's mutually beneficial. So that's a cooperative element. It's not a cooperative game. You could play it like two people sitting in on a hand, but not designed to be that way. Creative and party games. I've made reference to these. One of my favorite type of games, just because I very much like games where it's kind of original ideas or visual representation or thinking outside the box of how to represent concepts. And these are really hit and miss, and you've got to think about that too. If you're designing a game like this or you want to make a game for an audience, keep in mind there are not people who naturally like to do these things. So you have to think about that strategically when you're designing a creative party game. Or if you have a creative slash party element to your game, you have to think about those people who aren't going to just naturally gravitate towards sketching or they're not going to gravitate towards X, Y, or Z, right? You got to think about you know, how you're going to balance that experience and give them something they'll enjoy and give them access to that other alternative too. So a lot of options for creative party games. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites of recent and uh, i know brad who's been on the show before he also has another um live stream on participate.com as well he's got unscript ed he's popped into the chat and given me a hard time before um this one is one i played with him um i use this one with is sometimes my students too to work on their pitching for when we do shark tanks but silicon valley startups is a blast uh the premise of this creative or party game is that you are trying to pitch a startup idea to the judge and you want the judge to vote for your idea to fund, right? So kind of like you're on the Shark Tank. You're given kind of the industry that you're trying to pitch to. You're given kind of a product uh, as well to that and you're kind of given kind of the unique twist to that product as well. Uh, so you're, And you're also given uh, kind of a title to your product as well. So it might be a blank this and you know, you're given um, yeah, and, and uh, Sharif is right. It is There is a Jackbox game like that. I believe it's called Patently Stupid, and it's very similar. Um, yeah, for sure. Oh, and I see we got some sand tacos in here, too. Thanks for joining. Uh, and yeah, the uh, so yeah, it's, it's much like if you play Jackbox. I don't remember which party pack, but it's Patently Stupid. It's a phenomenal one. But Silicon Valley Startups is, is just uproarious fun because usually the start startups are absurd. So you're pitching this ridiculous company. And, but I will say this game that has a love-hate. Like, if somebody isn't good at on-the-spot kind of improv, it's very improv-y, right? Uh, but I like to play this game as a pair, so, like, the two people can play off each other, so pairs on a team. One person, if they, they're inspired, they can pitch it. If you kind of do a back-and-forth, like, handing off, it could get really funny. Uh, looks like, yeah, Sharif uh, pointed out for us it's Jackbox 5, so thank you, Sharif, for jumping on that. Yeah, Patently Stupid is the Jackbox version. It's great. Silicon Valley Startups is a blast. They've they've come up with great prompts, and they've just opened it up where the, the, the players can really run with the ideas. And shout out to Mandy Fralick, who introduced me to this game. And this game is like 15 bucks, maybe, I think, from Target. It's cheap. It's hilarious. Uh, just, just really creative. Uh, and just a, a one that I've used in my classroom uh, just to help students with their pitches just get used to the idea of pitching. And uh, it, it's, it's just one that, that people really seem to enjoy. And it's a fun one to watch, too. Just like it's a good spectator game, which is always rare. <laughs> so this is a creative ideas game where you are generating the original ideas. I almost thought to call this an improv style of the uh, kind of the genre. 
Another one of my favorites. And this one is kind of like, you know, there's apples to apples, right? There's Telestrations, there's Cards Against Humanity, and there's also Telestrations After Dark. So um, this is one that has like a, a, you know, all ages and an adult one. This is a very simple premise, kind of like telephone, uh, but with pictures. So it starts with, there's a, a word or a phrase. Um, the first person visually depicts that word or phrase. The next person guesses. The next person draws that person's guess, so on and so forth. You can do this up to eight times, play it with eight people, have eight kind of different guessing drawing, guessing loops going on. And at the end, you kind of go through the narrative of how the story changed, much like Telephone, but with pictures. Very fun. Uh, this is another one, too. Um, if you, I believe it's called Gardic Phone. Uh, and I didn't know there was like an online kind of spiritual successor. Shout out to my eSports club uh, who did this at our eSports camp. They, they, they said, hey, let's do a, uh, kind of an icebreaker with Gardic Phone. Very fun. So Telestrations is fun. Telestrations After Dark is kind of the adult version. Both are a blast. Everybody I've played this with has loved it. I feel like every time I play it, I cry too. So this it would be a creative representation game. There's a lot of games like this out there. Um, one, one that I think is worth noting, I just think it, it's, it's kind of, I think it kind of opened up the floodgates of thinking outside the box of how we, <laughs> seems like a board game pun outside the box. Um, but that kind of, you reinforce that idea of thinking outside the box would be uh, Cranium. Cranium kind of showed that, hey, there's a number of different ways to demonstrate understanding. And so Cranium, for example, came with Plato and said, represent something with Plato, right? Or represent something with acting or trivia answering or whatever it might be. So I kind of give credit to Cranium for saying, hey, look at all these different ways we have. And that's a game I think it did a really good job of kind of appealing to all sorts of people, right? Uh, another game I really like for creative representation is Pictures. And I didn't put it in the uh, presentation, but Pictures, uh, another Spiel des Jahres winner, I think last year's Spiel des Jahres winner, there's a grid of about 16 pictures. You're assigned one of the pictures secretly, so everybody gets a picture they're assigned, and you have a kind of your own station, that turn, of things to represent the picture. So one is like these abstract blocks, and you have to construct these blocks in a way that demonstrates which picture is yours. Or you get like a, nine, or a three by three square of like colored cubes, and you have to use nine colored cubes to represent your picture. So you have to try to represent the picture using a colored kind of cube, but you don't have all the colors and you might not have enough of some color and how are you gonna represent it? Um, one is like use two shoelaces to represent your picture. And so you go around and try to guess what everybody's picture is that they're trying to represent. And you get points if people guess yours and if you get other people's. It's great, I love it. Another great example of this one, but Silicon Valley Startups and Telestrations Illustrations After Dark, probably my two go-to creative party games. Uh, everybody has loved them. Um, you know, everybody just enjoys the either the absurdity or just how things can go take a left turn very quickly with those games. And they just reward you for two different strategies. Either somebody has a really effective pitch or a really effective Telestrations drawing, or they have something so absurd that it's great, right? So both of these games reward two different types of players and two different styles of play. And that's really important. Like if your game only rewards one style of play, that's trouble. And one thing I'll say about Game Stormers is I tried to, with the two different winning conditions of be the most popular game or be the game of the most victory points, I wanted to appeal to two different types of gamers. I'm in it for the points. I'm in it for the crowd appeal, right? I'm playing for the crowd. I'm playing for just declare me the winner by points, right? So that is a goal happening right there with that game. All right, another game that I absolutely love. This is a secret identity game, and this is one of the biggest secret identity games I've ever seen. So, uh, first of all, secret identity games, if you're familiar with Mafia, Werewolf, the there's this uninformed majority of people who are trying to find the bad guys. The bad guys are this informed minority of people who know each other are and are trying to work against the majority. That's basically the premise of a secret identity game, and they all have different ways they do that. One really simple spiritual successor to if you like Mafia and Werewolf, but you don't like the idea of like a game master doing it, a great way to get around that is a game called The Resistance or Secret Hitler does a good job of working around that. There's tons of different secret identity games. This one is one of my favorite creative types, uh, you know, just a really creative take on the secret identity game. Uh, yes, Santacos likes The Resistance, and it, yes, exactly. It is fantastic. It's just a really cleverly designed take on Werewolf uh, and Mafia. Just 
a really clever, unique, creative take that doesn't eliminate people. That's one of the weak parts of Werewolf or Mafia eliminates people, which is bad, right? <laughs> You're out of the game. You just have to watch and keep silent, which is no fun. Uh, so Two Rooms and a Boom, if you haven't played, I'll give you the, the kind of the elevator pitch of Two Rooms and a Boom. Uh, basically, there is a president on one team and a bomber on another. So there's two teams, president and a bomber, and then everybody else is on one of the two teams and has a special role, and there's two rooms. The goal of the bomber is to be in the same room as the president at the end of the final round, and there could be three, four, or five rounds. The goal of the president is to not be in the same room as the bomber at the end of the final round, right? So one team is trying to get them together. One is trying to split them up. The other people in the room have other abilities. Nobody knows who each other are. You talk to other people in your room and you decide if you want to show them who you are, if you trust them. So you chat with people, you decide whether to reveal yourself or not. And then in the room, you elect a leader and the leader decides who to send to the other room. So that person can kind of, you know, send people back and forth. So it's this interesting game of dynamics of how do you elect a leader in a room? Like majority votes in the leader. So one team, if they know who each other are, might take over a room and control the pack and forth. Then when people go back and forth, they can talk and be like, I think the president's in their room. I found him. Well, crap, I'm the bomber. We need to get him over here, right? Oh, but what if we if we send him too soon? He might get sent back if we lose control of the room. It's a very, it's a very back and forth game. Uh, I see Mike in the chat. Hey, Mike. Uh, Mike has played it. We've played it many times. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. It's great with more people just because it adds the chaos. You can play with up to 30 people, which is great. So it's great if you're a teacher. You can have a class play it unless you like teach in California where they for some reason have 40 kids in a classroom, which is crazy to me. Um, I do see Sharif mention One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which is a great twist. If you don't like how long games like Werewolf or... Mafia or Resistance last. Uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is like a single day and like trying to lock down who's a werewolf, right? Trying to vote out a werewolf or not. Great twist on that one. Uh, San Tacos uh, gave a shout out to Ku. Ku is a phenomenal secret identity game. It's a great twist to that one. Uh, you know, I think what's great about it is that it's a very simple secret character mechanic. Like you can claim to be a character and use their ability, which is a nice twist. And you can imagine somebody saying like, I like card games where you have an ability. I like secret identity games. How can I mash those up? So that's taking the deck game and taking the creative party game and, and kind of mashing those together into two, into one single game. So again, great inspiration there from San Tacos uh, on that one. And yeah, Sharif, I know 30 people, it seems crazy. I have played it with a full classroom of kids it is chaos, but in a good way. We played it with AP Psych students, uh, and it was just fascinating to watch how they approached it uh, in that game. So just fantastic. Um, yeah, well, where do you buy Two Rooms and a Boom? I, I know this. It constantly runs out of print. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know why they never have it in print. But uh, uh, yeah, Tuesday Night Games, I, I don't know if it's only like direct sales now. I, I think I saw I see it pop up on Amazon and it like jumps to an absurd price or something. So I don't know what the secret is with getting that game. But uh, they also had a successful Kickstarter uh, for the expansion to that game too, which is pretty cool. So just a fun fact for you. But yeah. Two Rooms and Boom is great. There is, I think you can find, Tuesday Night might have it on their site, but you can technically do a print and play, I think, of Two Rooms. Don't quote me on that. That would be an option if you want to go that route. But uh, Two Rooms and a Boom is great. And just endless card combinations. They have like 90 rolls that you can add in your game. Like there's even a third group of people who aren't affiliated with the team that can just kind of like mess with the results. Like uh, there's a there's a dynamic where there's like, a sniper, a target, and a bodyguard. And the sniper is trying to, at the end of the game, guess who the target is. The bodyguard is trying to um, get that the sniper to think they're the target. And then those people can also like just say, like, hey, Blue, I'll give you the votes in this room if you tell me if you've seen the target or whatever. And maybe the target talked to the Blue team and was like, hey, it'd be really cool if you could tell <laughs> the sniper that this person is actually the target, you know, and, and can and trick them, right? Or, yeah, it's the bodyguard or the decoy, I don't know, something like that. But it's just a fantastic game with all these little, like, miniature game-within-game -game interactions happening. It's, it's, it's incredible. That's all I can say. So um, that is a phenomenal game. Love it. You do need, I will say, at least six people. It's probably best with at least eight people. So you need a bigger group of people to play it. So if you're, you don't, if you have like a regular game night with four to six people, 
Jerooms and a boom isn't a great fit, but if you like get together, like you show up at game night at like a local game store and there's like 15 to 20 people playing a bunch of games, uh, then it's a great game because you get out all play together. Or like I said, if you're a teacher or you're, you run a summer camp or something, holy cow, it is perfect. So, oh, and San Tacos hooked us up with another link to it, 35 bucks. I think it's worth it. I don't know, two playthroughs. I'd pay like 17 bucks to play it twice with a bunch of strangers. That sounds weird. That's a, that's a weird thing to say, but also probably true. So I love it. It's also compact. It's just a card game. So really easy to travel around with. You can play it pretty quick. You can say, you know, each round is five minutes in, in the room. Make it like really pressure packed with how much time you got. You could do tons of things with it. So great game. The creative element in, um, <laughs> in, in Game Stormers is constant. Uh, and <laughs> So one, one aspect of this game is you, you can either use the drawn cards to make your game. So on your kind of game notebook kind of play mat, you can use your drawn cards. So um, right here you can see actually the newly designed, uh, the newly designed robot assistant is on there. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, you know, you can, um, you can kind of, you know, utilize those drawn cards in your story. I was just looking at the robot assistant power because I couldn't remember it. So he's kind of cool. You can use any card from the marketplace's ability. It's kind of fun. Uh, and then also you can make your own custom cards. We'll talk a little bit more about this mechanic in just a second, but um, you can see here, here's like a, a space pirate that I've added to my, uh, that I've added to my, my storyboard, right? As a mechanic, right? The space pirate mechanic, right? Space piracy, I guess I should have put in there. So I have made that custom card, a little stick figure, stick figure pirate to add to my card deck. So you can make custom cards and you can, you know, add cards from the game. And then the other thing too is you'll eventually pitch it. You'll for sure pitch it at the end. You'll pitch your whole game, kind of have a couple minutes, pitch your game, just like Silicon Valley startups, pitch it. Hopefully people will vote for you saying you had the best game pitch, right? Uh, you also, if you enter the arena, do a mini pitch of what you have thus far in your game to try to win currency. So there's two pitching opportunities that are creative games, and then there's the designing, custom designing. So you can see I got inspiration from two of my favorite games for Game Stormers. And this is what you do when you're designing a game. Just like a writer kind of borrows from their life, books, novels, movies that connected with them, resonated with them, Designers do it too. Game designers think about what resonated with them in games. One of the things I loved about Silicon Valley startups was the pitch. There's pitching in Game Stormers. One thing I love about Telstrations is ridiculous drawings. There's the opportunity for that. And you can be as detailed or not detailed as possible. It should really not affect whether you win or not, unless you've just got a drawing that's that ridiculous absurd, right? So this is a very simple space pirate. Like he's just a little stick figure, right? Okay. So that's an example of kind of that creativity coming through in Game Stormers, the upcoming release from us. Just want to get plug in for that. I alluded to the roll and do's as one of the most common first instinct of a lot of people when you're talking about, hey, game design, they make a roll and do. Usually it's a roll and move. I roll, it tells me where to move. The bad thing is that is not a great mechanic, right? It's not fair. If I keep rolling sixes, you keep rolling ones and you're winning by virtue of your sixes to my ones, it's not fun, right? Uh, not a very engaging way to play the game. So it's better if there's something more strategic about it, right? So, um, you know, if I'm rolling and deciding where I should go because there's a myriad of choices, that's a little bit better, right? I still might be punished for my ones, but at least I'm making a conscious effort to go somewhere instead of just being on a loop, you know, trying to get back around the loop or to the end of this route, right? So that's a key thing to think about with roll and do's. One example of kind of a fun roll and do is, is Deep Sea Adventure, a uh, very affordable roll and do. And this game kind of makes you choose whether to keep going forward or come back up for air. Um, so you're kind of trying to, to get as much as you can, but also survive. So it's kind of a strategic roll and do. Uh, also, I love it too. Um, it's a roll and move. Also from the same people who made um, uh, a fake artist goes to New York. So it has the same art uh, kind of style, the same artist from a fake artist goes to New York. Another fantastic game, by the way. Um, a Fake Artist Goes to New York is fantastic. But I like Deep Sea Adventure. Very simple roll and move with more strategy layered in. And that's the problem with a lot of roll and move games. Sometimes they don't have the best strategy. Um, what about a roll and write game? Roll and writes have absolutely taken off. So when we think of roll and write, 
probably one of the pioneers in the roll and write genre was Yahtzee. We roll, you write your numbers, you're trying to get those number collections first. That game was kind of on rails, right? There's kind of luck. Um, Pass the Pigs and uh, Bunko, I think, is another roll and write-ish kind of game. The, a lot of those are luck games. You know, you can turn off your brain, play them, bemoan when you have bad luck, be happy when you have good luck. Now there's more strategic roll and write games coming out. There's tons of them out there. Um, I'd tip my hat to Michael Matera again. I think I tipped his, my cap to him for Two Rooms and a Boom. But he's introduced me to so many, and he actually does a live stream called Let's Play, where he plays a lot of roll and writes. Because the cool thing about roll and writes is usually their design may be face to face to be played with a few players, but you could technically play them with hundreds if everybody has the game board. So, for example, Michael plays. Railroad Inc. and he's played with 30, 40 people online at a time because he just has everybody print out their little railroad chart. And then he rolls the dice. Everybody looks at the same roll and decides where to lay their railroad tracks to make the most connections. And my board is going to be infinitely different than yours based on the strategic decisions we make. And that's what makes it a good board game design is like we all have the same options, but we chose different paths and strategies. And so that's perfect. Like the playing field is even. We could all do the same thing. There's a m most optimum move, but it's hard to figure out. And if you start on one path and then you get more rolls and that ruins your path, well, that's too bad. Like that's a little bit of bad luck. But other people might have found a perfect little workaround to make it work. So Railroad Inc., a really clever roll and write. There's tons of roll and writes out there. Um, as well. Welcome to is a roll and write. Um, there's another one um, that's like a band going on a state by state tour and you're trying to make the best path for them to make the most points or get the most money or things like that. A lot of creative roll and writes happening and this is like a game genre that's absolutely exploded in the last decade. Really cool to see. And um, Game Stormers has a really interesting, I like to think, roll and do element to it. And so in its current iteration, um, what happens is you can go, uh, you can do on your turn what's called going to the theater and designing a card. It could be a storyline card, item mechanic card for your game. The idea is you go to the theater, you roll some of these uh, theater dice, and it gives you ideas that you can add to your card. So your challenge is to use one of the symbols on the card. So for example, in my Space Pirates, if I'm making a game where I needed Space Pirates or Space Piracy to be a thing, I might look at this little pirate guy that I've rolled here, if you're looking at the dice on the screen. And now that space pirate uh, is, um, you know, something I can just draw that little head and then make a card that says space pirate. All the cards that you create originally are worth a set amount of points. It's the middle amount of points, so it's not like the best, it's not the worst. You can add it to your game. So if your game has a gap and it's just, you're like, Ugh, I am not finding the cards in the deck I want, I'm going to make my own card. Or somebody could say, I'm going to make my own entire game of original cards. I'm going to roll the dice and let Lady Luck help me design it. You can do that. And the idea, too, with Game Stormers is hopefully there will be expansions, if everything goes well, where you'll get additional dice with additional symbols related to the additional card categories. Right now we've got the five categories represented here. Uh, civilizations, high seas, horror, fantasy, and sci-fi. So there are symbols that kind of correlate to those five narrative categories. Uh, and of course, you can do a totally different narrative not based on those. And of course, the expansions will give even more categories. So uh, just a little teaser of what that will mean. But I'm excited. I was inspired. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with Rory's Story Cubes, but Rory's Story Cubes are actually a bunch of dice that have a bunch of random symbols on it. You roll them and it helps with narrative writing. And again, this is kind of like, you know, going back to Sharif being in the chat and being a big D&D &D, uh, legend, um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is very much dependent on the rolling to tell you how the narrative goes. So it's an interesting twist. They work luck into D&D, &D, but your luck is based on your character, right? Your character, if it's better, doesn't need a big roll. Uh, you know, and if it, your character's bad at something, like he's a little imp and he's not strong, and he's doing a strength roll, he's going to need a really good strength roll, right? He's going to need like a you know, 15 and up, you know, on a, on a 20 die uh, to, in order to do something, right? So that's an example of purposeful chance, right? And it's kind of a press your luck. Like, I know this has a three out of four chance of failing, but I got to go for it. We need it. You know, this one, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to get with these five symbols, but hopefully I get something that I can work with, right? And it's creative constraint is the idea behind this. And the idea with this too is that hopefully 
people who aren't creative have something to work with. You know, they got an image and they can, you know, it'll help them with their story. And instead of them just saying to have to draft something out of their imagination by their lonesome, they've got kind of a little helper here with the dice to help them be inspired. So I'm hoping it both, you know, challenges creative people and helps people who don't feel as creative in the game. These dice are meant to help or constrain that creativity to not be just totally bonkers off the wall, right? So that's my idea. Um, if people want to do a side rule where you can just draw whatever you want, I'm not going to stop them. That's the beautiful thing about it. So these are roll and create uh, dice. I think I put cards, but roll and then you create a card. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, and Sharif has a point too. Um, so the, the, the game master also gets to decide what a successful roll looks like. Or you know, subtly change the roles. And that's what's really cool. If the game master really feels like it's necessary, they can kind of decide what would be uh, better for the narrative or better in terms of like, you know, how things are playing out or respond in real time to what's going on between the players. So that's a really good point from Sharif. Um, D&D &D even has even more built-in kind of functions, you know, almost like that uh, blue shell in um, Super Mario Kart where, you know, you kind of use it to get back in the game. So if the players have a devastating role and it's just bad luck on bad luck, game master can fudge that. Uh, great point from Sharif too. So a, 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 a nice advantage to D&D &D is, is that Game Master can, can kind of manipulate in a good way to make it a great experience for everybody. All right, final type that I'm going to chat about. Yes, you could argue with me that there's way more than these six types. When I actually started kind of, you know, working through game design with, with uh, you know, different individuals, I had eight and I kind of simplified it a little bit. So I've kind of grouped categories together to make it a little less intimidating. But another category that's out there is combat. There's tons of combat examples here. I just want to point out this is Darwin and Einstein fighting in GIF form, so I just had to use it as my combat uh, represent, <laughs> representation. Uh, looks like Sharif wants that GIF. I can, I can hook you up with that GIF, Sharif, for sure. Uh, it is one of my favorite GIFs. So uh, combat games, there's a lot out there. This is one that's incredibly popular uh, with my family. And uh, Bang the Dice game I first played at an ISTE conference, International Society of Technology and Education conference. I don't know who had it. might have been Michael Matera. might have been somebody we were with. But Bang the Dice game is a really, uh, first of all, it's very affordable, not very expensive. But it's an example of an elimination game. It's also a cooperative game. Um, it's a secret identity game, so it's kind of a creative party game. It is a roll and do game. You decide what to do with your dice after you roll them. It's really almost every, yeah, it's a card game too. It's a deck game. My gosh, this one might touch them all. There's not really a meeple movement, I guess. Yeah, no, not really a meeple movement. But this game checks almost every game type box. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so in Bang, you might be a, a member of the sheriff's team. You might be a member of the outlaw team trying to eliminate the sheriff. Or you might be a renegade working for yourself. So the sheriff team wants to eliminate the outlaws and the renegades and keep the sheriff alive. Outlaws want to kill the sheriff. Only goal. Renegade wants to get down to mano a mano with the sheriff and like a little shootout and win. Very hard to be the renegade. But that's the premise of the game. You can have games from as few as I think three people up to uh, eight, seven people. It's a great game. Um, yeah, San Tacos also loves Bang. It's fantastic. Uh, so Bang the Dice game, very popular, I think, especially in my wife's family, because they are very, like, I mean, this is a good way. They're very cutthroat in their games. Like, they just, like, they want to, not only do they want to win, they just want to, like, mess with each other in game. And so they love it. Um, you know, it's just, like, fun watching, like, there's this inside the game game where they just kind of pick somebody to absolutely just terrorize, you know, using the dice. And so in the game, you can choose to, if you roll, like, a gunshot, you can choose to shoot at somebody if you roll like health giving, you can get health back, all that fun stuff. There's a survival aspect. There's a discerning who's on your team and who's not because only the sheriff is revealed. The sheriff um, doesn't know who anybody is. Everybody knows who the sheriff is. So you're trying to figure out based on people's actions, who they are, all that good stuff. People can play, claim to be anybody. It's chaos. It's really great. Uh, but I will say one bad thing about this is it's an elimination game. People get eliminated. Um, I believe San Tacos mentioned Coup is a great game, but it has an elimination component, which is a bummer. So you can be eliminated from Coup before the game's over. Thankfully, games are short. So if you're going to have an elimination game, ideally it's short. Mafia or Werewolf can go on for a while, so the elimination component kind of stinks. Just saying. So that's something to think about when you're doing a combat game. Is the elimination component miserable or is it okay, right? Something to think about, but Bang is a great example of an elimination game. 
Other elimination games, very common. Magic the Gathering is an elimination combat game. You're trying to eliminate the player you're against. You can technically play Magic the Gathering with multiple people. So you could play a three-player game. One person gets eliminated, the other two, mano a mano, right? You don't do it a ton, but it's out there. Um, Pokemon, training card game. Very popular, uh, especially my nephew loves it. It's an elimination combat game, right? The, you're trying to eliminate all your opponent's Pokemon. All there is to it, right? These games are everywhere. But not all of them are elimination games. Another popular uh, genre is area control combat games, where you're actually just trying to dominate spa physical space on the board. And this comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. One example would be Risk. Uh, I am constantly playing a game of Risk uh, with some friends, uh, you know, all over the United States and even overseas. I think Mike was in the chat earlier. Uh, we're, we're like always have a Risk game going or another form of Risk or Diplomacy or um, Empires or whatever it might be. And, you know, it's just this back and forth. But what's interesting, what makes these games kind of fun is kind of the also the back and forth of kind of deal cutting, right? Alliances things of that nature, you know, to achieve your objectives, sometimes you need to join forces with someone, determine when to cut ties and then turn on that person. That's kind of the intrigue of those games with, with me personally. And there's other types of area control that are not war games. For example, pandemic is area control, right? Controlling the outbreak of a disease. It's a little too soon to be playing pandemic in my opinion, but it's a game that's out there that technically is a cooperative area control game. So something to think about. And then there's also combat games where it's about achieving result. Maybe you need to get to a certain point to win in your combat. So an example of this is King of Tokyo is both a um, elimination and result game. You can either win by accumulating victory points for um, you know hurting the you know hurting somebody who is the King of Tokyo, or you can also um, you can also eliminate somebody by just knocking their health out, knocking all players out until you're the last monster standing and you are king of tokyo right so that's a way to do it as well uh, another way I, another game like this kind of is smash up you need to smash the most locations on the board you know and you're kind of defeating and fighting other beasts in the game so it'd be kind of a combat-ish achieve results game so a lot of different ways to crack the combat egg kill each other in the game or eliminate each other get to a certain desired result control dominate spaces on the board get to a certain point right a lot of different ways to do the combat game. All right, and ooh, Dragonwood, a great players versus enemies combat game, yeah. Uh, and a lot of games that were on this list earlier are technically combat. For example, uh, I mentioned that uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is a uh, cooperative deck building game. It's also combat. You are fighting the bad guys, and if the bad guys deal too much damage to you, you lose, right? And if you deal more damage to them and eliminate them, you win. So that's another combat game, right? So a lot of different ways to crack that egg. I find combat games really engaging, uh, especially for the younger audience, just because they have been introduced to maybe a Pokemon trading card game. Maybe they played Magic the Gathering. Maybe they played some of those games growing up. That concept makes sense. Maybe they're video gamers, and a lot of video games are combat-based, right? Uh, depending on, you know, maybe it's like more cartoonish combat versus violent combat, but combat nonetheless. Or maybe they're strategy games where you're trying to eliminate... Um, the evildoers on the board. So uh, a lot of combat games introduced through the form of video games that would make sense as board or card games too. So something to think about as you're playing. I will have to check out this Dragonwood. I, I heard of it, but haven't played it. So I'll give it, I'll give it a look. In Game Stormers, uh, there is a combat element to a degree. The closest is that arena again, where if you go into the arena, it is not the end of the game, but you're going in to win some coin uh, versus other people. And so this would be the closest combat element. You're not directly trying to hurt each other, or eliminate anybody, but you are trying to get the most votes to emerge victorious. And if you do that, you are going to get four uh, four credits versus they them getting one, or you split two and two credits if you tie. So this is kind of a combat situation. Mano a mano, somebody gets a benefit and gets closer probably to winning because they have more currency. So there's a risk reward in electing to combat someone. I like this mechanic too because some people might not like their chances and might avoid it and that's okay. They have other ways to make money versus other people who might say I'm confident in my idea. I'm going to give it a shot, right? So a lot of different ways to tackle that. All right. I am looking at the time. I am right at that nine o'clock central time and amazingly I'm done with the, <laughs> done with all the six types of games. So if you're keeping track, 
at home for those six types of games. We had the Meeple Movement uh, style of games. We had the uh, Roll and Do. We had the deck games. We had the combat games. We had the cooperative games. And we had the creative or party games in no particular order. They're all wonderful game types. If you're trying to get inspiration, mash up two different types or more and see what that would create. Think about some of your favorite games in those genres. What do they do well? What mechanics do you like? And really, Game Stormers is a celebration of a lot of mechanics I love. It has the goal of exposing you to different game types, but Game Stormers at its core is a kind of a deck game where you are trying to make the best game with your deck of cards or created cards that you add to your deck, right? So that is kind of the core game type, but there's many inspirations from other game types. So thanks so much. Uh, I just love the live chat uh, tonight, love the ideas, so shout out everybody who's jumping in, Sharif, Vika, Mike, uh, San Tacos as well, appreciate it, so uh, everybody have a great rest of your evening, thanks for tuning in, uh, let me know what games you're playing, would love to hear, and tune in for the next episode, I'm going to take uh, next week, just uh, uh, take, take that week off, I'm going to be deep into the middle of nowhere um, the day after um, the Independence Day, so I won't be on the 5th, but for sure, back July 12th. Um, and we will talk, most likely on the 12th, we'll talk uh, a little bit about prototyping, which should be fun. So check that out. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good night.